Hi everybody, this is Chris Morosky and this is a short video on hormonal contraception. The learning objectives of this video are to discuss the contraindications of combined hormonal contraception, to review the hormonal components and mechanism of action of combined hormonal contraception. Uh, we will also describe the risks and non-contraceptive benefits associated with the use of hormonal contraception. We'll then discuss the options for emergency contraception and end this video uh, by reviewing uh, the various different kinds of intrauterine devices. So when prescribing combined hormonal contraception, uh, one of the most important things to figure out is which patients should not use combined hormonal contraception. Um, and since the majority of combined hormonal contraception is um, oral contraceptive pills, you're going to hear me kind of use OCPs, oral contraceptive pills, and combined hormonal contraception um, interchangeably in this video. Uh, but keep in mind there are also patches um, and rings uh, that women can use for um, hormonal contraception. So moving on to who should not be using combined hormonal contraception, uh, the questions that I like to ask patients are the following. Do you think you're pregnant? Do you smoke cigarettes and are you older than 35 years of age? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have a serious medical problem such as heart disease, blood clots, lupus, or diabetes? Do you have or have you ever had breast cancer? Do you often get bad headaches with blurred vision, nausea, or dizziness? Are you taking medications for seizures or are you taking St. John's wort, rifampin, or griseofulvin? Do you have vaginal bleeding that is unusual for you? Do you ever have jaundice, cirrhosis, or an acute liver infection or tumor? Do you have gallbladder disease or have you ever had jaundice while taking OCPs during or during pregnancy? And um, have you ever become pregnant on the pill? Are you planning surgery with a recovery period that will keep you from walking for one week? And have you had a baby in the past 21 days? So all of these are pretty much contraindications to women going on combined hormonal contraception um, because all of these things have um, serious consequences when women are exposed to higher doses of estrogen. So moving on to what is in a combined birth control pill. Um, there's really two components. There's the estrogen and the progestin. For the most part in birth control pills, uh, the estrogen is ethanol estradiol, and there's the occasional pill that has mestranol, but that's really more in Europe and not in America. Um, and then there's uh, the progestins, which are um, either testosterone derived or spironolactone derived. So unfortunately, we're not going to get away um, from talking about combined hormonal contraception and the hormones that are in the pills without doing a little bit of biochemistry but I assure you this is actually pretty cool. Moving on to estrogen, um, here's part of the cool process. In 1938, um, it was figured out that um, estradiol could be made orally active by adding an ethanol group uh, to the 17 position um, of the estradiol chains. And you can see that little ethanol group that's uh, tacked out by the red arrow on the right. Uh, and this made it possible to take eth to take est estradiol orally and have it be um, active. Um, mestranol, in the next slide here, um, really is very similar to ethanol estradiol. You can see on the left from the last slide, but what's happened is that mestranol has a um, three methyl ether ether um, added to the um, three methyl uh, position of the uh, molecule. And that's mestranol right there. Same thing, orally active, acts as an estrogen. For the progesterones, um, we start with the 19 nortestosterones. And so in a similar um, process back in 1938, the biologic hormone testosterone um, had an ethanol group um, applied to the 17 carbon. Um, and that's, that made um, ethosterone, which was orally active. And then in 1951, uh, they figured out how to remove the 19 uh, carbon, which you can see um, in the lower um, red arrow, um, is now replaced with a hydrogen molecule. Um, and this um, created norethindrone, which has much, much more progestational activity rather than androgen activity. And so it um, activates progesterone receptors much more than it activates androgen receptors, and it's still orally active, so it acts as a progesterone. Um, you can see here, um, in this slide, that the norethindrone, which is an 18 carbon plus an ethanol group, is very similar to progesterone, which is a 21 carbon molecule. 
There are two groups of nortestosterones. There are the estrain progestins, which include norethindrone, norethinadrol, norethindrone acetate, and ethanoldiol diacetate. Um, and these all have weaker progestational activity. Um, and that's in comparison to the gonane progestins, levonorgestrel, gestadine, norgestimate, and desogestrel, desogestrel uh, which have stronger progestational activity with gestadine, desogestrel, and norgestimate having less androgenic activity than levonorgestrel. And you're going to see levonorgestrel does have a good amount of androgen activity. Um, and the last progestin to talk about is drospirinone. Um, and this, um, you can see, is the enantiomer of spironolactone. And while it does have strong progestational activity, it also has anti-mineralic corticoid and anti-androgenic effects. Okay, moving on to the mechanisms of action of combined hormonal contraception. The estrogen here, um, importantly, suppresses FSH secretion, um, and this prevents a dominant follicle from forming. Um, estrogen also stabilizes the endometrium, and this helps with breakthrough bleeding. And finally, estrogen potentiates the action of progesterone um, as it upregulates the progesterone receptor. Uh, the progestin um, atrophies the endometrium, and very importantly, it thickens the cervical mucus, uh, similar to the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. Um, progesterone also delays fallopian tube peristalsis and decreases um, secretion in the fallopian tube. And finally, progestin uh, feeds back to the pituitary and it inhibits the LH surge. So combined together, all of these effects pretty much keep women um, around the um, luteal phase-like part of the menstrual cycle, uh, which is unfavorable to um, ovulation. Okay, there are some certain risks of combined hormonal contraception. As we had mentioned before, there are certain patients who shouldn't take these. Um, and a lot of this really revolves around the estrogen um, that's in either the pill patch or ring. So uh, the risk of throm thrombosis is serious. Um, and what ends up happening, particularly with birth control pills, is that the oral estrogen undergoes uh, first pass kinetics in the liver. Um, this increases hepatic production of procoagulant factors. Um, and specifically, it increases factors 2, 7, 8, 10, and fibrinogen, and it also decreases antithrombin and protein S. The overall thrombotic relative risk as compared to um, a woman not taking birth control pills is 3 to 5 times, but very importantly, this needs to be weighed against the uh, risk of thrombosis in pregnancy and postpartum, which is 4.3 to 10 times higher than a woman who is not on birth control pills and who is not pregnant. Um, there are other factors that increase the risk of thrombosis, and these include smoking, hypertension, and coagulopathies. And for patients who have patients who have one of those risk factors, um, you really don't want to be putting them on estrogen-containing contraception. Hypertension is another issue um, with initiating combined hormonal contraception, and will affect about five percent of users. The exact mechanism here is not well understood. Um, but likely the re renin angiotensin uh, system is involved as the liver makes angiotensinogen, which is a renin substrate. Um, and perhaps there's also activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which can cause elevated blood pressure. Um, breast cancer is something that's often talked about combined hormonal contraception, um, as breast cancer is a hormonally responsive cancer. However, the majority of research shows that there is minimal to no increased risk of breast cancer with the use of combined hormonal contraception. Um, and some of this research shows that um, this really depends on when the um, combined hormonal contraception is taken, with there being much less risk if the um, birth control pills, patch, or ring are taken at younger ages. There's also um, a rare benign liver tumor called a hepatic adenoma. Um, this is seen in high estrogen states, such as pregnancy or with the use of um, combined hormonal contraception. These adenomas can be very painful. They can grow quite large, up to about 10 to 12 centimeters each, um, and they can rupture, which is dangerous. Um, once identified, it's very important to stop the combined hormonal contraception. Uh, pregnancy can also be an issue for these patients um, because there are high levels of estrogen and progesterone in pregnancy. Um, and fortunately, they do tend to shrink or resolve once the estrogen levels are decreased or the contraception is stopped. 
Aside from the risks, there are some non-contraceptive benefits of um, combined hormonal contraception, and these are important to discuss with women when they are considering this form of birth control. Um, the non-contraceptive benefits include uh, less endometrial and ovarian cancer, fewer ectopic pregnancies, regular lighter periods with less anemia, less, less salpingitis, increased bone density, and also there's likely improvements in endometriosis, benign breast disease, fibroids, and ovarian cysts. There are also, also some FDA-approved indications for combined hormonal contraception, um, in particular birth control pills, and in particular certain birth control pills because the companies um, did the research to prove that the pills um, do have these indications. The first one is mild to moderate acne vulgaris, um, and this is indicated in women who um, also wish to have um, oral contraception. Um, the mechanism of action here is that the estradiol uh, increases sex hormone binding globulin from the liver, um, and this binds up uh, free testosterone, lowering total testosterone levels, and lowering um, the acne. Now, most likely all birth control pills this uh, all birth control pills do this. Um, it's just that some companies alone have spent the money to get FDA approval. Another FDA approved indication is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, it's important that these patients meet the DSM-4 criteria for this, where they have um, severe symptoms beginning one to two weeks prior to the menses and ending once the mens or ending with the menses. Um, the only medication that is FDA approved for this indication is um, Yaz which is the um, combined birth control pill that has drospirinone. Um, but again, this is probably just some research that got done by the uh, company. Um, and most likely, most birth control pills um, do provide some benefit here. Now you can get transition to emergency contraception. There are several forms of emergency contraception. Uh, the first one is levonorgestrel, also known as Plan B. Um, there's Plan B or Plan B one step. Plan B is taken as a 0.75 milligram pill 12 hours apart, and Plan B one step is um, a 1.5 milligram pill taken once. It's important that this um, emergency contraception be taken within 72 hours after unprotected intercourse. Um, and the mechanism of action is to suppress the LH surge by negative feedback at the pituitary. Um, Plan B has no effect after the LH surge. Um, it has no post-fertilization effect. Um, it is not an abortifacient. Um, and if a pregnancy has occurred, implantation um, will happen normally, and this hormone does not affect the developing embryo or fetus. Up to 89% um, effectiveness is seen um, to prevent pregnancy if it is taken within 72 hours, but it is much less effective after 72 hours. The next form of hormonal um, emergency contraception is uh, ulipristol, also known as ELA. Uh, this is taken as a 30 milligram tablet. This needs to be taken within 120 hours or five days after unprotected intercourse. Olipristol is a selective progestin receptor modulator. Um, and very interestingly, when there's a low concentration of progesterone in the serum, um, ELA acts as an agonist. When there's a high concentration of progesterone in the serum, um, olipristol acts as an antagonist. So prior to the LH surge, when there is a low concentration of progesterone, um, olipristol acts as an agonist on the pituitary and blocks the LH surge. After the LH surge, where there's rising levels of progesterone, um, olipristol starts to work as an antagonist at the ovary, where it blocks expression of progesterone receptor-dependent genes, preventing ovulation. And this is what allows olipristol to work after the LH surge. Um, also, it is an agonist at the fallopian II progesterone receptor, and it decreases ciliary beating frequency and muscular contraction. All of these combined together make olipristol more effective than Plan B. There is another form of emergency contraception called the YPSI method, um, and what this really is is um, a bunch of different combinations of regular combined oral contraceptive pills. Um, this all does need to be taken within 72 hours after unprotected intercourse, similar to Plan B. Um, unfortunately, these combined pills do contain estrogen, um, which is not necessarily needed here and can, and can cause some nausea. And um, patients are really unable to take as much potent progestin as the 1.5 milligrams of the levonorgestrel, um, and therefore it is not as effective as Plan B or Ella. But this is something that women can do for themselves if they have a pack of pills at home. 
and it is still about 74% effective, so really it's an option um, that's better than just not doing anything. Finally, the copper tea intrauterine device can be used um, and is the only IUD approved for the use as emergency contraception. Um, it can be placed up to five days after unprotected intercourse. The copper ions themselves are toxic to sperm. Um, it is likely also toxic to post-fertilized um, post-fertilization embryos. Um, and there is some discussion about whether this is emergency contraception or abortifacient, depending on how you define pregnancy as either a fertilized egg or as an implanted um, fertilized egg. Um, once inserted, uh, the copper tea intrusion device can be used as a long-term reliable form of contraception. Um, if implantation has occurred um, and a pregnancy um, is established, it is important to discuss with the patient the risks and benefits of keeping the IUD in place while she is pregnant as there is an increased risk of miscarriage, septic abortion where patients can get very sick and require pregnancy termination, um, and preterm labor even later in the pregnancy. Just quickly reviewing into uterine devices before we close. Uh, we did discuss earlier the copper TIUD. Um, when used as um, a form of contraception, the copper in the foreign body reaction causes sterile inflammation um, within the uterus. There is an increased amount of endometrial prostaglandins. There's an increased amount of endometrial white blood cells. Um, and the IUD and the copper ions change the composition of the uterotubal fluid, and all of this put together is really inhospitable to sperm. Um, the IUD is very effective with a 0.6% failure in the first year, and um, this IUD can be left in place for 10 years before it needs to be replaced. Then there are the various hormone-releasing IUDs. Um, there are several types of these. Um, they can be left in the uterus for three to five years, where they release progestin at a very steady rate, and this progestin is pretty much only combined to the uterus and the pelvis, and there is minimal systemic side effects. Um, all of the IUDs um, in this setting release a progestin. Um, for the most part, that is levonorgestrel. This thickens cervical mucus, blocking sperm entry pretty much completely. It also atrophies the endometrium, which causes decreased menstrual bleeding, um, where it can be used um, for that indication alone. Um, this hormonal IUD is also very effective with a 0.2% failure rate in the first year of use. So wrapping it up here, I think we're able to pretty much uh, cover pretty well the contraindications of combined hormonal contraception. We also reviewed the hormonal components and mechanisms of action of combined hormonal contraception. We discussed the risks and non-contraceptive benefits associated with the use of hormonal contraception. We did discuss the options for emergency contraception. And last, we reviewed the um, intrauterine devices. Thanks for your time watching our video here. Um, good luck in your studies, and we'll be seeing you in class. Take care.